Hi, my name is Harper Montgomery, and I teach modern and contemporary Latin American art at Hunter College in New York City. I'm going to read my paper today and um, occasionally call out images, um, and it relates to um, ongoing and long-term research that I've been doing um, for at least the past decade on uh, networks of Latin American intellectuals um, and artists. Um, this area of research focuses on the 1920s. So the title of my paper is Artworks Find Meaning on the Network, Two Printed Fields in the 1920s. Mobility was the normative condition for many artists and critics in Latin America during the 20s. Traveling among cities like Lima, Paris, Buenos Aires, and Mexico City, they drew on what we now call modernism to question the cultural authority of Europe. To understand its anti-colonial aspect, modernism in Latin America must be thought relationally. The modern art of the region cannot be interpreted according to conventional spatial terms is either located within or without, is carrying traits that are either local or imported. To argue that anti-colonial modernism existed, I trace a network of artists' texts and images whose circulation depended on travel and the expansion of print culture. And this is a grid of images of some of these artists and what their works look like. The artists on this network were steeped in European intellectual history but they also cut short trips in Europe to return home at a moment in the 1920s when many believed European culture was declining. They embraced modernist concepts with the hopes of countering colonialism with direct anti-historical veins of aesthetic experience. Today, I will trace two of the threads of this network. I will look at the Lima-based magazine Amauta and at the circulation of woodcuts. Other threads that I cannot talk about today, but which I trace in my related book, um, include Carlos Merida, Jules Solar, Emilio Petaruti, Nora Borges, and Mexican children. So now I'm showing you a slide um, of a Mauta and some of the representative images published within it. The editor of the magazine Amauta, Jose Carlos Mariategui, believed that Latin American art expressed an anti-colonial point of view, that although pertinent to individual countries, also exceeded them. For him, American art was an imaginative project. He saw it as a visionary aspect of social revolution, linked to the future and not tied to the pragmatics of social change in the present. In the early 20s, he made contact with writers and artists from Argentina and Mexico while he was living in Europe. When he returned to Lima in 1926, he fashioned a Mauta as an intellectual hub by asking these contexts to provide its content. Until his death in 1929, a Mauta provided a place for Latin American intellectuals to share their most pressing artistic and political concerns. Mariategui used reproductions of art in a Mauta to express a clear set of convictions. Number one, that art should communicate meaning through form, not narrative. Number two, that it should draw on popular culture. And number three, that it should not be used for politics, even though Mariette Gui himself was deeply committed to leftist politics. This is a slide of a mount with um, Picasso, Gross, and others. Um, although a mounta, which means wise man in Quechua, enveloped its contents in a Peruvian indigenous framework, its interior pages present art as symptomatic of the global orientation of Latin America. The fact that the Peruvian artist Sabogal persuaded Mariategui to call his magazine a mounta and not Vanguardia, as he originally intended, indicates its local global orientation and suggest that intellectuals saw themselves as part of European culture, even while they were questioning it. So the next slide is of Petruti, Merida, and Devesqui. Um, using sequence and page design, Mariategui invites us to compare portraits by Argentine, Guatemalan Mexican, and Peruvian artists. Printing Petruti and Merida's paintings as monochromes accentuates their formal similarities. All three artists depend on reduced vocabularies of form. 
Pedruti builds his portrait of the Peruvian poet Hidalgo from polyhedrons that emerge into light. Merida constructs the two Mexican women from planes of flat tone. De Vescovi portrays himself dreaming with minimalist lines. The artist's different experiences are indicated by formal signs. Having recently returned from Europe, Petruti was making Cubist paintings in Buenos Aires. Merida was experimenting with primitivism in Mexico, and De Vescovi with surrealism in Paris. The artists also use forms to communicate the different classes and genders of their subjects. Petruti and De Vescovi convey the nomadic experience of avant-garde living abroad by not placing their sitters in specific settings, while Merida uses curvilinear lines and flat shapes to represent traditional women whose bodies appear to belong to the rural and domestic environments they inhabit. Two figures are named male and cosmopolitan, while the others are anonymous, female and rural. Along the bottom edge of these portraits, the experimental poem, Cinema de los Sentidos Puros, or um, Cinema of, of Pure Sensations, um, by Enrique Peña Baranechea, demonstrates a similar principle at work in language. Just as Petruti, Merida, and De Vescovi evoke reality but do not realistically describe it, so the poet communicates his desire for a woman called Miss Dorothy. With impressionistic language, he has borrowed from his urban surroundings. And here I'm going to show you the text with translation. As the poem ends, the lover expresses his disappointment through typographic means, concluding that the situation is hopeless. Now I know that you walk down the avenue and the mirrors yell, here, 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 end quote. Like the artworks, Peña Baranechea's poem demonstrates the abstraction of language, how linguistic meaning can be conveyed through visual and auditory forms. An article appeared in the same issue, What Will American Culture Be? In this text, the Peruvian philosopher Antenor Orrego argues that Latin American culture is destined to be located somewhere between Mexico and Argentina's contrasting postures towards Europe. On the one hand, Mexico has severed its ties and turned toward indigenous culture, as the argument goes. On the other, Argentina has absorbed European culture. Thus, Petruti and Merida's works demonstrate Borrego's two cultural, quote, poles of America, end quote. But the act of showing them side by side does not so much reinforce dichotomies. Instead, it presents a productive relationship. And now I'm going to move on to woodcuts. During the 1920s, woodcuts also became sites of exchange and movement. In woodcuts, we see mobility as dissemination, repetition, and reframing. As mobile images, woodcuts convey collective, manual, and anti-rational modes of creativity, depending on their contexts. The woodcut was not, in my narrative, a medium that realized the socialist dream of art for the masses, but it was able to embed itself in the arenas of mass culture with the goal of changing the tastes of middle-class people a goal that carried with it two political aims, one, to free them from the bind of seeing culture as something European, and two, to make subaltern subjectivities visible to them. From the early 1920s, woodcuts connected intellectuals in the region as well, allowing them to share this advanced art form. When the young Mexican poet Manuel Maples Arce announced his strident stridentist movement in the weekly Mexico City-based magazine El Universal Ilustrado, he included a woodcut by the Argentine artist Nora Borges, doing so because her image of a traditional procession in Mallorca possessed markers of futurism. While the Peruvian artist Jose Sabogal was passing through Mexico City in 1923, 
he learned woodcut from the Mexican, French-born Mexican artist Jean Charlot. When in 1928, critics in Buenos Aires praised an exhibition of Sabogal's prints that occurred there, this success both legitimized Sabogal's work for audiences in Lima and encouraged avant-garde in Buenos Aires to experiment with this new form of the woodcut. During the mid-1920s, the types of venues where woodcuts were displayed and reproduced also expanded. They appeared in galleries dedicated to, quote, new art, and in many literary and popular publications in Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Havana, and Lima, even in a mass distributed daily newspaper in Mexico City. In these circuits, at times, the same image can be found in multiple publications. And I'm showing you a slide now of examples of some of these prints, including Gabriel Fernandez Ledesma's print in the daily newspaper in Mexico City, El Universal. In Mexico, the physical actions required to carve and print woodcuts lent themselves to meanings associated with manual labor and artesanía, or folk art or arte popular. Small and cheap to make, woodcut was taught to children and workers and could be made by anyone who had access to wood, ink, and paper. In his writings, Jean Charlot extolled the laborious beauty of woodcuts, citing them as proof of the creativity of the Mexican people. He argued that woodcuts demonstrate that Mexicans of popular origin produce and appreciate modern forms of art, and he contended that middle-class Mexicans could learn to appreciate the abstraction of woodcuts by emulating a mode of looking already unconsciously practiced by the popular classes, and that this could cure middle-class Mexicans of the bad habit of admiring reproductions of third-rate European art. The next slide is of an example of um, covers of a mauta and images of mate burilados. Outside of Mexico, Mariategui was the most enthusiastic receptor of these ideas, which he pushed to more politically pointed ends in a mauta, where he reproduced Mexican woodcuts and wood carvings in a context in which the labor of mestizo artisans had already been recast as art. Mariategui encouraged the artist Jose Sabogal, to use a mounta to argue that Peruvian artesanía was of great artistic value. Sabogal wrote a text for the magazine on Mate Burilado, the carving of gourds practice by people of the Ayacucho province in Peru. And Sabogal often replaced the woodcuts that usually appeared on a mounta's covers with drawings of Mate Burilados from his own collection. Mate Burilados had also been featured in the magazine Forma, the Mexico City-based magazine, where Diego Rivera argued that both Peruvian and Mexican artisans exhibited a keen sensitivity to what he called, quote, the conditions of materials, end quote. Mariategui, and this is another image of a mauta, um, indicated both his agreement with Rivera and his more ambitious vision when he grouped local and cosmopolitan artists working with wood under the heading, quote, Arte Americano, or American art. And this is an American um, deliberately excluding the United States, of course. An abstract print by Sabogal resembling a primitive mask appears on the cover of the issue and inside the following sequence. First, a bust by the self-taught Mexican artist Mardonio Magaña, then a door made by students of the School of, quote, direct carving in Mexico City, and last, a print by the Argentine Adolfo Belloc. The Magaña introduces the sequence, and the door and the Belloc face each other across a single spread. Why Sabogal's cover signifies the primitive modernity of the woodcut Belloc's print demonstrates the medium's technical modernity. Magaña, an autodictat, carves wood in the roughest manner. The students display their finer skills by depicting the different workshops of their school in Mexico, 
and Belloc uses a zinc plate to emulate a woodcut look for mass production. This was one example of many prints he had made to illustrate novels and collections of short stories in Argentina. Despite the, their obvious differences, the Belloc and Magana share iconography. They both portray picturesque types, an old man wearing a straw hat and a chinita dressed in her regional Northwestern costume. Both, however, offer grim, uninviting versions of these types. The man appears openly disagreeable, and Belloc's Chinita turns away from us, absorbed deep in thought, even though she is meant to represent a romantic character in a story by Juan Carlos Dablos, a popular author from the Salta region of Argentina. A text in the same issue provides an anti-colonialist framework for interpreting these images. In his essay, Hay Varias Americas, or There Are Various Americas, the Peruvian anthropologist Luis Valcarcel notes that, quote, a longing to create American culture, end quote, preoccupies intellectuals. And he argues this task must be understood as an imaginative enterprise, citing two prominent and then well-known philosophers, the Mexican Jose Vasconcelos and his concept of mestizaje, and the Argentine Ricardo Rojas and his theory of Urindian culture. But even more importantly, Valcarcel stresses that culture is at the same time a symptom of colonialism and a tool of defense against it. The, quote, art and architecture of Latin America, he explains, are marked by its history of European colonialism. But culture can also help the region defend itself against U.S. imperialism. It is appropriate, and this is my last slide, a group of Cuban prints, or I should say prints reproduced in a Cuban magazine. It is appropriate to end with the Cubans, because defending their country against U.S. colonialism was one of their most pressing concerns. But it is also important to stress that they participated in the woodcut's tendency to primitivize. Unconcerned with interrogating picturesque types, they valued the woodcut as a means for turning away from their reality and embracing the romantic figures of the Indian, the Afro-Cuban, and the mestizo peasant. Timoteo by Fernando Leal was one of many Mexican woodcuts published in the Havana-based magazine Revista de Avance. It pictures an Indian subject rendered in a roughly carved woodcut, but its gouged marks were not associated with work or craft in this context. Instead, they were read as evidence of an admirable lack of artistic intentionality and as expressive marks conveying hidden emotion. Timoteo conveys an inward quality in both form and iconography, so much so that Leal's print was incorrectly attributed to the Cuban artist Carlos Enriquez when it appeared in Revista de Avance. At the time, Enriquez was experimenting with surrealism, and read as a surrealist image, Timoteo's mysterious quali qualities are amplified. And while his name appeared in an earlier printing, in this instance, it drops away. He squarely faces us, but we cannot see his eyes. He is paired with a view of the Bay of Havana, in which Enriquez has distorted a railing that extends to the lighthouse to convey the physical sensation of vertigo. Next to this image, Timoteo's face looks especially closed and lacking exterior emotion. He is extremely close, but completely impervious to our gaze. Timoteo's impervious look reminds us that fashioning modernism as an oppositional posture often required calling on its most suspect tendencies, and that with its efforts to dispel power relations also came tendencies to efface social inequality, and to co-opt the positions of others, to mythologize race and extend a primitivist gaze. But I want to argue that even though these operations were often marked by inequality, 
an oppositional politics still inflected these modernisms. In refiguring assumptions about the roles art can play in the world, revisionist studies of modernism have shown that it is a far more impure enterprise than we have acknowledged. What was in the past presented as universal or even beautiful is now recognized as politically coded and marked by the authority that comes with power. And yet art historians continue to assess and interpret the visual and material forms of artworks. And contemporary artists continue to stage sensorial engagements that suggest that stretching concepts of art can force productive reassessments of belief systems. My aim has been to show how artists and critics during the 20s used modernist tactics to navigate the network that formed their reality. But even more, I have aimed to show how they used modernism to assess their place within this network's power relations. These, I think, are the reasons why transient media, like the woodcut or mobile sites of display, like Amauta, are fundamental to modernism's retelling. Thank you very much for your attention.